Peace and love, black family. It's the Prince of Pan-Africanism, Dr. Umar Johnson. I'm coming to you live and direct tonight from St. Louis, Missouri. I want to send a shout out to all my brothers and sisters from St. Louis, Missouri. I am here. My first visit in more than two years. Uh, there was a typo on my post where I indicated that I was in St. Louis and my last visit was in August of 2015. That was not correct. My last visit to St. Louis, I believe, was February of 2015. So it has been well over two years since Dr. Umar Johnson's last visit to St. Louis, Missouri. I want to say rest in peace to our brother Michael Brown. Uh, condolences to his family because parents never get over the loss of a child. I will be in Ferguson, Missouri tomorrow for the first time. I will be in Ferguson, Missouri tomorrow for the first time doing an interview at, at a Missouri radio uh, station, uh, Hot, what is it, Hot uh, 91, Ferguson Live, forgive me. I will be doing that interview with Sister Lady Ray J, who is gracious enough to bring the Prince of Pan-Africanism onto the Ferguson Live Network. That is tomorrow at approximately 5 p.m. What I want to do tonight, family, and just to let my brothers and sisters know in the state of Missouri, I will be speaking in St. Louis the day after tomorrow. Friday, April the 28th, Dr. Umar Johnson will be in St. Louis, Missouri. Friday, April 28th, first visit in two and a half years. I will be at the Better Family Life Center. I repeat. I will be at the Better Family Life Center. Doors open up at 4, power lecture from 6 until 9, book signing and picture session to follow. I have some brand new straight from Garvey headquarters, red, black, and green flags. So Missouri, make sure you come out and get your red, black, and green flag. Take down the white Jesus in your house and hang up a red, black, and green flag in place of the white Jesus in your house. Every black household, on every unapologetically African household needs to have a red, black, and green flag. If you don't have a red, black, and green flag in your home, then you are not a part of the unapologetically African movement. And then on Sunday, the Prince of Pan-Africanism, the most requested black scholar on the planet, I will be speaking in Kansas City, Missouri for the first time since 20. 14 Kansas City, Missouri for the first time since 2014. So it's been over three years since the last time I have been in Kansas City, Missouri. I will be at the Mary Keller Center. Doors open up at three o'clock this Sunday in Kansas City, Missouri at the Mary Kelly Center. And the power lecture will be from five until eight. And the book signing and picture session will follow. Today, I want to talk about something that I have not talked about on Facebook Live yet. You all know that I have been focusing so much of my public message on the war against black boys, and rightly so, and necessarily so, because the war against the black boys is much more aggressive than the war is against any other learner inside of the American social order or inside of the American classroom. We know that special ed is almost exclusively black male. Psychiatric meds is almost exclusively black male. ADHD is almost exclusively black male. Juvenile detention, juvenile incarceration, gang warring, uh, low test scores, mental retardation, learning disability. Black boys are overrepresented in every single category of juvenile and childhood dysfunction. And I will continue to talk about the psychoacademic war against black boys. But tonight, tonight, I want to talk about our daughters. Tonight, I want to talk about our princesses. I want to talk about the psychosexual war. See, it's a psychoacademic war against the black boy, but it's a psychosexual war against the black girls. So tonight, I want to talk about princesses in pain. I want to talk about princesses in pain, the war against black girls. Now, just to give you a couple of statistics to set off tonight's conversation, black girls are 17% of all students in America. Black girls 
are 17% of all students in America. However, black girls are 31% of all girls referred to law enforcement. Black girls are 31% of all students and children, female children, referred to law enforcement. That means our daughters are being arrested and sent to juvenile detention at a rate that is twice the numerical population amongst the female gender in the United States of America. Black girls are 43% of all school-related female arrests. Black girls are 43% of all female-related childhood arrests. Now, the feminist movement, and I know this is going to upset some of my feminist sisters out there, and that's all right, because you all know I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. My job is to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. But one of the functions, whether it was intended or not, does not matter. When we're dealing with genocide, the intent doesn't matter, only the effect. When we're dealing with genocide, the intent does not matter, only the effect. And one of the effects of the feminist campaign in black America is that it has helped to recreate the image of the black female into that of a black male. I'm going to say it again. One of the negative outcomes of the feminist movement in black America is the feminist movement has helped to recreate, to rebrand the image of the black female into a black alpha male. The purpose of reinventing the image of the black female as a black alpha male is because it makes her just as much a threat to the American social order as it makes her black male counterpart. And if the black female can be rebranded as an alpha male, if she can be rebranded to be just as physically imposing and as dangerous as a black male, then her genocide, her murder, her police beatings will be acceptable in the eyes of the public because she has been recreated as a menace to society. And this is something that the feminist movement has not dealt with. And this is something that black women have not challenged the feminist movement to deal with. Why are y'all rebranding our image in such a way that it presents the black female as a menace to society as a public enemy and by rebranding the image of the black female as a menace to society you make homicide justifiable you make murder justifiable you make police genocide justifiable against the black female by rebranding her as an alpha male facts facts so that's something that has to be dealt with 34% of black girls did not graduate high school in 2010. 34% of black female children did not graduate from high school in 2010. Black girls were suspended six times as often as white girls. Let's look at that. Black girls were suspended from school six times as often as white girls in America. In 2013, in 2013, 43% of black young adult females were without a high school diploma. In 2013, 43% of young black female women were without a high school diploma compared to only 28% of white females who are without a diploma. Black women still own, earn only 82 cents to a white woman's dollar. Black women still only earn 82 cents, 82 cents to a white female's dollar. Now let me tell you why this is relevant. President Barack Obama, as you all know, put forth an Equal Pay Act for white females. He signed a law to 
to give white women the power to make just as much money as the white male. In other words, he wanted gender parity in income. Dr. Umar Johnson takes no issue with gender parity in income. I have no problem with President Barack Obama signing a law for gender parity. That's not my issue. A woman should take home what a man takes home. But let me tell you what I got a problem with. I got a problem with the fact that President Barack Obama did nothing about the fact that the black female does not take home the same amount of money as the white female, even when she has the same education, the same experience, and is doing the same work. So if you want to do an equal pay act, if you want to make sure that the white woman takes home what the white man takes home, former President Obama, don't you think it is also your responsibility to make sure that the black female takes home what the white female takes home? How are you going to fight for gender parity in income? How are you going to fight for gender parity in income, but you don't fight for equal income between the women of the two different races in this country? So it's okay for white women to earn more money than black women. It's okay, President Obama, for white women to earn more money than black women, but it's not okay for the white man to earn more money than the white female. That's what you call hypocrisy. That's what you call hypocrisy. Now, let's keep on going. There's 23.5 million black women in America. 23.5 million black women in America. In fact, 52% of all black people in America are female. 48% are male. Now, of course, that statistic probably is a little bit off. But what it says is that we really don't have as significant a numerical discrepancy. But what we do have is a war against black males that sends them to the cemetery, sends them to the prison, and has them being recruited by the homosexual movement. The sodomy movement is snatching up black boys like crazy. I don't think I go a day in my life without seeing at least a dozen black boys who have been recruited by the sodomy movement. So something has to be done about that because our girls will not have men to marry them when they become of age if black men and black women don't stand up and speak out against the sodomy movement. The sodomy movement is a recruiting movement and something has to be done about it. I picked up the Time Magazine the other day. I picked up the Time Magazine the other day. Did y'all see this? Okay, this, you know, I'm always in the airport, so I need to read. This is last March 27th. You see the cover? It says, beyond he or she. Beyond he or she. Okay, this is a boy. Beyond he or she. And it says, how a new generation is redefining the meaning of gender. How a new generation is redefining gender. The meaning of gender. Now, I didn't told you that ice people don't know how to live in accordance with nature. I've taught you that ice people cannot live in accordance with the laws of the universe. Whatever the universe has created, ice people have to recreate in a dysfunctional manner. Nature has given us regular crops Ice man and ice woman want to come up with genetically modified crops. The universe has given us four seasons of the year. Ice man wants to manipulate the seasons and create other ones. Nature will give you tornadoes, hurricanes, storms, but the ice man wants to manipulate his own tornadoes and storms. Nature gave us man for woman and woman for man, but the ice people want to come and do this to our children. And you asking me why I want to build a Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. 
And you asking me why I want to open a Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy. This is why. Let's look inside. Beyond he or she, a genderless America. In the genderless America is going to lead to a blackless America. A genderless America will lead to a blackless America. Let's, let, let's find this here. Let's find this here. Beyond he or she. Page 48. Okay. Beyond he or she. Here we go. Infinite identities. Infinite identities. You don't have to be a girl no more. You don't have to be a boy no more. A growing number of young people, so says the article, a growing number of young people are moving beyond the idea that we live in a world where sexuality and gender only come in two forms. Did you just hear that shit? I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read it again for all you comatose sleep ass black folks out there. Let me read it again. A growing number of young people are moving beyond the idea that we live in a world where sexuality and gender come in only two forms. Now, last time I checked, it was man and woman. African people are the oldest people on the planet. African people are the oldest people on the planet. We are two million plus years old. Every time they think they know how old we are, we end up finding out we're even older, right? So for two million years, we have only identified gender as what? Male and female. For two million years, all of a sudden, we come to the 21st century. All of a sudden, we come to the 21st century and we got this. Let's see. Many young people from an early age, personally known people who are out, Glad Survey found that millennials, for example, are twice as likely as boomers to have someone in their circle who identifies as bisexual, asexual, queer, or questioning. Bisexual, asexual, queer, or questioning. No, no, and then they got some kids up here telling you how they identify. Okay? So Grace, who is 17 from Utah, she says she identifies as bisexual. She believes that one's gender or sexuality can change. Quote, there's no reason you have to say, oh, I'm gay, and there's no way I will be anything else for the rest of my life, says the high school senior, because there is the possibility that you might find out you like something else. So she said you can go from straight to bi to queer to a you can move around and experience all of the different sexualities. And then we have Kyle from San Antonio. He says, growing up in a small conservative Texas town, Kyle worried about coming out as gay. But he says that teenagers today are more empowered and more aware because of social media. Quote, we are able to see a bird's eye view of all the different types of people that exist. That exposure opens people's eyes a little bit. Sophie, who's 19, says... Quote, I don't understand why people are so attached to labels like male and female. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all just hear that? She says, quote, I don't understand why people are so attached to labels like male and female. I have an answer for Sophie. No disrespect to the young lady. 
But the reason we're so attached to labels like male and female is because that's what we were born as, Sophie. We came out of our mothers as males and females, Sophie. That's why we're so attached to the label. I just wanted to touch on that. And to clarify, because I don't want any of you misrepresenting the philosophy and opinions of the Honorable Dr. Umar Johnson. I do not hate anyone. And I definitely have no hate for African people. Be they gay, straight, transgender, asexual, bisexual, queer, or questioning, and especially our children. Our children are confused. Our children are confused. They don't need us judging them and condemning them. They need us embracing, engaging, and loving them. We can fix all this. We can fix all this. But it's going to start with us building our own schools to properly educate our own children. I'm going to say it again. We can fix this. We can reverse all of this. See, this is white culture. This is Eurocentric social programming. This is not African culture. So what you're dealing with is cultural imperialism. One group of people trying to dictate to another group of people how they should live their life, operate their community, and build their families. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic that the same people who have destroyed the black family for four centuries in America, isn't it ironic that the same people who have destroyed the black family for four centuries wants to come back and tell you how to reinvent the black family? Confusion is the weapon of oppression. Confusion is the weapon of of oppression. Whenever you want to keep a people oppressed, keep them confused as to what their true priorities are supposed to be about. See, they want our kids fighting for this instead of fighting for freedom. They want our kids fighting for this instead of fighting for liberation. They want our kids fighting for this instead of fighting for equality. In the art of war, you must take the mind of the youth and redirect the energy into a socially acceptable channel of struggle and lbgt multiculturalism that is the white power structures alternative to black revolution they want our young people to get involved in fighting for this instead of fighting for their lives so we want to fight for sex instead of fighting for our community we want to fight for sodomy instead of fighting for our community this is the new illusion of inclusion right here Confusion is the weapon of oppression. Now, I want to give you my assessment of some of the top problems that I see facing black girls. I want to give you my assessment of some of the top problems that I see facing black girls. And if this conversation is too much to you, because some of you, are operating on a very low vibration. Some of you have a very low consciousness. Your whole life is about likes and comments and hip hop and pocketbooks and sneakers and rap videos and who shot who and who hit the lottery. If you operating on a low level of consciousness, zone on out. Zone on out. Just click me off and go watch the NBA playoffs. Zone on out. This is for people who are trying to get from point A to point B. This is not for intellectual masturbators. This is not for integrationists. This is not for LBGTQers. This is not for reactionary Eurocentric feminists. This is for nobody except those who want a sincere movement to move black folks from where we are now in a state of decadence to a state of independence. I said this message is only for those who want to move our people from a state of decadence to a state of independence. China, I see you. Shanghai, I see you. Beijing, I see you. Hong Kong, Japan, I see you. Nagoya, I see you. Birmingham, England, I see you. Paris, France, you will see me this fall again, Paris, France. I know it's been two years. The Papa will be back in Paris. 
Papa will be back in Paris. So I want to give you my assessment. Let him troll, brother. See, let me tell you why the trolls can't get off the page. And I'm going to get back to my message. I'm a Leo. And in the Zodiac system, the Leo is what's planet. The Leo represents the sun. The sun is the light. Now, you might not like the sun, but there's no way you're not drawn to the sun's rays because you need the vitamin D that the sun creates in order to survive. So no matter how much you don't like the sun, the brilliance and magnificence of the sun, which is the center of the solar system, it forces you to pay attention to it. So the trolls got to stay. They got to learn because their subconscious, their ancestors is telling them to stay tuned even though their ego want to bail out. Facts. So let them troll. We all used to be there. We all used to be anti-African at some level or another. We all used to be that. When I was in fourth and fifth grade at Mead Elementary School, we wanted to be Hulk Hogan. We wanted to be Randy Savage. We wanted to be Tito Santana. We was collecting wrestling magazines. We would go home and make a wrestling belt out of aluminum foil and cardboard. So we all was there. We all got to come into the consciousness. So be patient with the detractors. They still family. When it's time to eat, everybody going to sit down at the table and feast together. When it's time to eat, everyone will sit down at the table and we will feast together as family. I'm not paying no attention to that. Because it is within the nature of the universe for the original family of God. See, we the original family of God. We the chosen ones. We the firstborn. We the firstborn. We come from supreme consciousness and everyone else comes from us. We the firstborn. It is within our DNA for us to come back together. So I'm not worrying about that. The only question is how long we going to wait? How long are we going to wait before we get up off our asses and do it ourselves? I could sum up Garveyism, revolutionary Pan-African nationalism in two words, our own. Two words. What does Dr. Umar believe in? Two words, our own. I don't want his hospital. I want my own. I don't want his woman. I want my own. I don't want his community. I want my own. I don't want his bank. I want my own. I don't want his oil. I want my own. Whatever everyone else can do for themselves, we can do for ourselves. But in order to get there, black family, we got to go through some growing pains. In order to get there, black family, we have to go through some growing pains. What do I mean when I say growing pains? When a child is born, the child has to learn how to crawl. After they learn how to crawl, they have to learn how to walk. And in learning how to walk, they're going to fall sometimes. How many of you fell all the way down the steps when you was learning how to walk? You was a one-year-old going up the step and you let go and you fell all the way back. I hit this big head a lot of times on them steps at 16th of Susquehanna. I hit this big old head a lot of times come falling down them steps at 16th of Susquehanna Avenue in North Philadelphia where we lived at. I bumped this head a whole lot of times. But I got right back up and learned how to do it again. It's called growing pains. The white man ain't got to go through the growing pains. He did it 400 years ago. The Chinese ain't got to go through the growing pains. They did it 100 years ago. The Arabs ain't got to go through the growing pains. They did it 75 years ago. It's your turn. It is your turn to go through the growing pain. And then some of you say, why do we have to go through the growing pains for? Ain't nobody else going through it. Because they already went through it. They didn't did it already. The reason you have to do it is because during slavery and colonialism in Africa, they held us in a state of arrested development. During slavery and colonialism, they held us in a state of perpetual arrested development. We could not move because we were under direct oppression. So while they held us, they was building why they held us, they was building. When we was in slavery, Italy was building. Russia was building. Ireland was building. 
Britain was building and they held us in the state of babies while they grew to be adults. They held us as infants while they grew. So now you have to wake up and do for yourself what they did. They didn't did it already. You ain't done it yet. And the longer it takes us to get started, the further behind we will fall. Facts. Facts. So let me talk about some of the issues I feel are facing young black girls. Number one. One of my biggest issues as it relates to the war against our young black princesses, our beautiful little queens, and of course I have two daughters myself, early sexual objectification by their own parents. Facts. Black girls are too often sexually objectified by their own parents. Black mother, I'm talking to you. Why is your 12-year-old girl Daughter wearing shorts and miniskirt with her thong hanging out. She got a big breast and, and you got the breast hanging out and she ain't nothing but 12 and 13 years old. Why are you sexually objectifying your daughter that young? That is unacceptable. You sexually objectifying girls at 10, 11, and 12. And don't make the excuse that's how they make the clothes. That's how they dress now. That's what a mother told me. That's how they dress now. What do you mean they? Who is they? Who is dictating the dress code? The same people that are allowing our daughters to be raped and sexually abused are the same people controlling the dress code. You can't afford to let your daughter do what everybody else wants to do. Soon when she's nine and ten years old, soon when she start going through puberty, soon when she get her menses, you already showing her how to sell her body to men for free. Aunts and cousins and ladies in the neighborhood is demonstrating for our daughters how to sell your body to men 10, 11, 12 years old. Something has to be done about that. I'm not saying they got to have a turtleneck on. I'm not saying they got to have their face covered. I'm not saying they got to be covered down to the ankle. No. She could show a little flesh. Boys show a little flesh. But it shouldn't be, she should not be accentuating the beauty of her body so often as a young child because you're teaching her to sell herself. That's a form of prostitution. It's unpaid prostitution. Cover that little girl up. We got to stop sexually objectifying our daughters. And then you get mad when she get pregnant. You get mad when you find out she lost her virginity and you sexually objectifying her. And black man, you need to check yourself. Because no black man with daughters living in that house with them girls should be allowing your daughter to dress in a sexually provocative way that young. Black girls are more likely to be pedophile, more likely to be molested, more likely to be raped than any other woman. Don't you let society sexually objectify your daughter. So we got to deal with that. Related to that, another issue that we need to deal with as it relates to our beautiful black girls is the fact that we be letting them date boys who are too older than them. Too much their senior in age. We got to do something about this. We got to do something about this. Why is your 14 year old daughter dating a 21 year old? Why is your 15 year old daughter dating a 25 year old? Why is your 16 year old daughter dating a 27, 28, 29, 30 year old man? I'm meeting girls in the high schools whose baby dad's almost as old as me. How the hell is the father of your child almost as old as the damn school psychologist? Come on, y'all. That's prostitution. I know girls mature quicker than boys. I understand that girls mature quicker than boys. I understand that. But at the same time, we need to understand that even though she may mature intellectually quicker than him, 
He has been around the block longer than her. And his ability to manipulate and exploit that girl is significantly greater than any intellectual understanding she can have about dating as an adult. We got to do something about that. We letting these grown men impregnate our teenage girls. We letting these grown men impregnate our teenage girls. When are we going to stop this? And I'm going to get on my Aki's for a minute. I'm going to get on my Aki's for a minute. All right? In the African-American Sunni Orthodox community, I'm going to just put it out there. I don't give a damn if you like it or not. Most of y'all don't identify as African anyway. You want to be Arab. But in the African-American Sunni Orthodox community, this is also a problem. This is also a problem. And it gets swept under the rug because y'all say, well, yes, he's 10 years older than her brother. You know, she's 15 and he's 25, brother. But she took her shahada and he took his shahada and they got married. Did they get legally married? Hell no. And the minute he get tired of that girl, all he got to do is say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And then he dropped her like a bad habit. Don't tell me I was raised in the mosque. I was raised in the mosque. And y'all need to do something about that. Talking about you serving a law and you letting these grown men exploit these teenage girls and you try to cover it up with your religion. Go somewhere with that. Go somewhere with that. Here's another issue. Here's another issue we got to deal with when we're dealing with black girls. And that is black mothers... Black mothers and fathers, black mothers and fathers, but especially the mother is more likely to throw her daughter out the house than throw her son out the house. I'm going to say it again. Black mothers who are running 75 percent of our homes, black mothers, 75 percent of the time are single parents and it's not their fault. But black mothers got this thing with their daughters. Black mothers, a lot of them got a jealousy thing with their daughters. And black mothers are more likely to throw the daughter out the house. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I meet them all the time. Dr. Johnson, my mom threw me out the house. I came in late. Dr. Johnson, my mom threw me out the house because I got pregnant. Y'all got to stop doing that. When the black mother throws her daughter out the house... Normally because you're jealous. There's normally jealousy. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes she is too disrespectful. That's true. But you can't put a female child on the street, send it to a shelter, send it to another relative, send it to a friend in the neighborhood. But you cannot afford to take our future queens. You cannot afford to take our future queens and throw them out on the street when you know what can happen to your baby out on the street. You don't do that. You don't do that. And you have less patience with your daughter than you have for your son. Your son selling drugs out your house. Your son then got arrested. Your son running girls in and outside your house. Your son then cursed you out. Your son don't go to school. Your son don't work. And you don't throw him out. But the minute she do something wrong, the minute your teenage daughter do something wrong, you throw her the hell out the house. We got to stop that. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And then I didn't see so many girls in my years as a school psychologist and a therapist. I didn't see so many girls who got thrown out the house by a young mother. Got thrown out the house by a young mother because the young mother was afraid that the boyfriend wanted the teenage daughter more than he wanted her. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. If you think a man is liking your daughter, if you think a man has an attraction to your daughter, then that man don't belong in your house and he don't belong in your life. He don't belong in your house and he don't belong in your life. That is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. My mom put me out because her boyfriend was looking at me. My mom put me out because I told her I think her boyfriend liked me. He be giving me strange looks. He made inappropriate comments. Are we that thirsty? Are we that thirsty? Are we that thirsty that we will throw our daughter to a wolf for a Negro you only knew a couple months? 
And nine times out of ten, he ain't paying a single bill for you. Black girls are more likely than black boys. Black girls are more likely than black boys to be molested at home by a relative. The childhood molestation of black girls is absolutely, unequivocally, a crisis that is being ignored by the black church. It is a crisis that is being ignored by the black masjid. It is a crisis that is being ignored by the conscious community. It is a crisis that is being ignored by the black community itself. Too many of our girls are being molested at home by male relatives and female too. Because statistically, women abuse children sexually as much as men. Let me say it again. Statistically, women abuse children sexually as much as men do. But black girls are more likely than boys to be molested at home. And then after they get molested, after the black girl gets molested, she's expected to keep her mouth shut. Look at this. After the black girl gets molested at home, she's expected to keep her mouth shut about the molestation, who did it, how they did it, when they did it. And most black girls who are molested at home are molested repeatedly. Black girls on average are molested three times by the same perpetrator. Three times by the same perpetrator. Why? Why? Because in this family, we don't talk about sexual abuse. In this family, we don't talk about pedophiles. This is what you do. Y'all don't say nothing to the uncle or the cousin who molested the child. And y'all tell the child, keep your mouth shut. Just let it go away. And then y'all go to church and pray. Go to the mosque and make salat and don't do nothing about the pedophiles. If I'm wrong, tell me. I see it too many times. I've had people bring me letters that girls have written. Letters that our daughters have written begging for somebody to do something about it. They know what I'm going to do. When they bring me the letter, we call them Child Protective Services. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't deal with white supremacy, but you molest the child. I'm turning your ass in. Oh, yes. Oh, you don't want to. Oh, you don't want to tell. You don't want to. You better. You better call. Her. I'm going to call. Letting our little girls go through that hell. And then that begins to do what? Erode their respect for black men. That begins to erode their trust for black men. That begins to destroy their confidence for black men. And then that becomes a breeding ground for lesbian recruitment. That becomes a breeding ground for lesbian recruitment. And then once the girl gets sexually abused, once our daughters get sexually abused, there's different ways that they try to cope with the sexual abuse, different ways. One of the ways our daughters try to cope with the sexual abuse is by having more sex because they think if they can have more sex, it'll drown out the pain. They think they can numb the pain of abuse by having more sex. You know how if you got an elbow, your elbow hurt? You got a tender elbow. So you say, if I keep on doing this, maybe it'll get numb. Maybe it'll stop bothering me. So you try to numb it with the pain. You're hoping enough pain that it'll just become numb. And that's what a lot of our daughters do. They have repeated sex and they start becoming promiscuous because they try to convince themselves that they actually like being used because they don't know how else to cope with the pain. And it only makes it worse. He said, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Hebrew, I'm a Moor, I'm the Wapian, I'm a God in earth, I'm whatever you want, and plus, you can't put me in no box, I'm African, and whatever label you want to put on back of that, put on back of that, an African Hebrew, an African Moor, an African the Wapian, as long as you put the African in front, you can label me whatever you want, I'm bigger than your names, we got to get out of this name stuff. We want to keep on naming everything. Acting like white folks. That's what they do. They want to name everything. Here y'all go. Y'all want to name everything. 
You Muslim, you Hebrew, you whole tap. What difference does that make? We family. If your brother changes his name, does that make him any less your brother? If your sister changes her name, does that make her any less your sister? If your grandma changed her name, does that make her any less your grandma? Y'all still family. It's the blood tie. This is a blood connection. Can't no name separate the blood that we all share. Get out of here with that Eurocentric name stuff. Y'all want to put everybody in boxes and shit. What box do he go in? What box do she go in? There's only one box I want to be in, and that's the freedom box. Put me in the freedom box. Now. And then, when the black girl gets kicked out the home, she's more likely to be raped on the street. Because, see, when she gets kicked out the home, what's the first thing the girl going to do? She's going to run to a boy. She's going to run to a boy. Nine times out of ten, she didn't have a father in her life. Because if she had a father in her life, she would have went to dad's house. Or dad would have told the mother, you ain't putting my daughter on no street. Or dad may have to check her ass and say, don't disrespect your mother no more. But you don't put no princess in training on the street for any reason. For any reason. And that's why we're going to build the Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy. That's why we're going to build the a Amy Douglas the Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy. Black girls are sexually abused more than any other girl. And this is why black women, my feminists, can I ask my feminists a question? Why hasn't the black feminist movement created a campaign targeting the sexually exploitative hip hop video industry? Y'all not on your job. Y'all feminists are not repping y'all cold because there's no way in hell that every other gangster rap video is sexually exploiting the black woman's body and sexually objectifying the black woman. And I ain't heard a feminist group yet. I ain't heard a feminist group yet put together a serious campaign where you target the music companies, you target the videographers, you target the production studios about sexually exploiting the black woman's body. Why haven't you feminists done that? If you're going to be a feminist, be one for real. Don't be half-stepping. Don't be whole tepping with this shit. If you're going to be a feminist, be a feminist. Where are the feminists at when it comes to the hip hop industry sexually exploiting our women? Where are the feminists when it comes to the fact that black women only take home 82 cents of a white woman's dollar? That's another campaign. That's another campaign. Where are you black feminists at? Where you at? Or you just want to beat up on black men because of past trauma? Or you just want to beat up on black men because of past trauma? What's going on? Let's keep on going. I can't say enough about fatherlessness in black girls. I can't say enough about fatherlessness in black girls, brothers and sisters. See, when we talk about ain't no daddy at home disorders, girls suffer from that too. In fact, the girl might suffer more. See, the boy suffer because he ain't got that role model. The boy suffer because he ain't got that daddy image that he can emulate. But when the girl ain't got her father, psychologically, it can damage her more because she don't get to, she doesn't get to practice loving a man appropriately, not sexually. Not sexually, spiritually, and psychosocially. Because that girl needs to love on dad. And she needs the dad to love on her. Not sexually, psychosocially. See, if a father hasn't hugged his daughter and said, I love you. If a father ain't looked at his daughter and said, you're the most beautiful thing I ever seen in, your, in my life. If a father ain't took his daughter and said, listen to me, I want you to know. That I don't care how many other men tell you you beautiful. When I say I'm your father, I mean it. And I don't want nothing from you because I'm your father. And I want you to know that anytime you need to be loved up on, that's what daddy here for. But if the father didn't do that, if the father wasn't there to do that, soon when that girl comes across some high school nut, Soon when that 
girl comes across some high school nut who tell her she fine, who tell her she gorgeous, who tell her I love you, who tell her I want to hug up on you. She ain't used to hearing that. She's not used to hearing that. So the psychological thirst, the psychological thirst that that causes in the mind and soul of our daughters will lead that girl to giving up her virginity to a nobody. Will lead that girl to early teenage pregnancy to a nobody. And this is why I tell you fathers, teenage pregnancy is our fault. Teenage pregnancy is our fault. And I'm going to say shame on any mother out there who keeps their daughters away from the father for your own personal selfish reasons. Shame on a mother who keeps their daughters away from their father for their own selfish personal relationship residual issues. You don't know how important that daddy is to that daughter. That daddy daughter, that mommy son. That's something that you ain't never supposed to met with. That's a relationship that God put in place. Which takes us to teenage pregnancy. Teenage pregnancy has been going down because the LBGT movement been recruited. 2016 or 2015, America registered its first significant drop in black female teenage pregnancy in over 30 years. The Department of Health, they said black girls aren't getting pregnant as much as they did before. I know, because y'all got the LBGTQ recruiting every damn body. That's why they're being turned out by their own gender. That's why the damn uh, teenage pregnancy is down. But even though it's down, the teenage pregnancy is still an issue. We still got too many girls getting pregnant. Now, let me clarify. Black girls don't have the highest teenage pregnancy rate. Right. Latino girls have the highest teenage pregnancy. Latino girls have the highest teenage pregnancy. But, of course, that includes Afro-Latino, which is still us. Do you feel me? The Afro-Latinos, which is still us. And if there's any Afro-Latinos... On my feed that's connected. I want you to reach out to me. We need to have a serious Afro, African American, African Latino conversation. It's overdue. It's it's really overdue. It's we got to come together and we got to put this shit who black and who ain't. We got to deal with it. Because you got some Afro Cubans who say they want they black, and then you got other Afro Cubans who want to be white. You got some Afro Puerto Ricans who want to be black, and then you got some Afro Puerto Ricans who want to be white. So we want to come together as a community and find out whether or not y'all serious about this Pan-African struggle. I heard one Latina, Afro-Latina sister, she was honest. She said, I'm an African Latina. I'm black. I'm part of the RBG. I respect that sister. But the question is, what about the rest of the Puerto Rican community? Because I used to live in a Puerto Rican community and they don't see themselves anything got to do with blackness and they look just like I did. So we need to have a community conversation. So I'm asking my African Cubans. I'm asking my African Dominicans. I'm asking my African Puerto Ricans. Get in contact with Dr. Umar Johnson. I want to have a serious discussion on the relationship between the African Latino community and the African American community. Are we going to work together as a race or are we going to keep this shit divided over language? Because the only thing different between us is your ancestors got dropped off in the Caribbean and ours got dropped off in Virginia and Charleston. That's the only difference. My great-grandfather was a Spanish-speaking Cuban, and I'll be going to Cuba in August to look for some of my relatives. 
Look for some of my African Cuban relatives. So we all black. And I'm not forcing you. I want to be clear. It is a privilege to be an African. It is an honor to be an African. So if you don't want it, we don't want you. But some of y'all want it. And I need to know who wants it. Because I do not want to deny any African Latino, any African Latina, their birthright to be African. But I need you to be African 100% of the time. Don't be African when you come to the Dr. Umar lecture. Do you want to go back to being a white Puerto Rican when I'm not around? We got to put this shit on the table and air it out. So if you Latino, Latina, particularly Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans, because that's where we got the biggest issue. The Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and the Dominicans. Hit me up and let's have the conversation. You can do it through my website, you can email me, drumarjohnson.com. That's D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson.com. Okay? You can email me through the website. You can also email me directly, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com. D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson at yahoo. Or you can hit me, 844-4-DR-UMAR. 844-4-DR-UMAR. Okay? Well, you can hit me on my personal cell, 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. Okay? I'm not looking for no wife right now, so we're not, we not on that right now. Okay? So, let's get back to the conversation. Low self-esteem. See, black girls are predisposed to be taken advantage of because they develop low self-esteem as a result of the father's not being present. And as a result of the father's not being present, it destroys the self-concept and self-image of the black girl. So when a boy comes along and makes her feel better about herself, he can almost get her to do anything he wants because she craves that masculine validation from her daddy that she never got. See, a mother teaches a daughter how to be a woman. A mother teaches a daughter how to be a woman. A mother teaches a daughter how to be a woman, but a father validates her womanhood. A mother teaches her how to be a woman, but it is the father that validates the womanhood. And if a girl don't get her womanhood validated by her father, she going to look for that validation for the rest of her life. How many of us know sisters? And this is with all due respect. We ain't making fun at nobody. This is just anecdotal. This is anecdotal. But how many of us know women who 40 years old still thirsting for that validation? 50 years old, still thirsting for that validation. 60 years old, still thirsting for that validation. 70 and 80 years old, still thirsting for that validation. Like you might say, why would they still be thirsting for that validation that old? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Psychologically, psychologically, we do not develop mentally as quickly as we develop physically, psychologically, we do not develop mentally as quickly as we develop physically. See, every last one of us has a mental age and we have a physical age. Do you follow me? So you might be 25 physically, but you could be five mentally. You might be 45 physically, but you might be 29 mentally. And that's why it's important that when we start looking for a partner, looking for a mate, that we put an age on their maturity. Because if you 40, operating at 40, but you about to marry a woman or a man who's operating at 15, who got all types of issues from their childhood, because they got stuck. So you can get stuck when your needs are not fulfilled at a certain level in your life. You can get stuck. So some of us are still stuck at five.
45 because we had needs for attention that we never got. And now we 45 and we still just as thirsty for attention as we were at five because we stuck. Some of us didn't get enough attachment with our primary caregivers. And we 30 and 35 years old now and we still looking for that presence of our primary caregivers and we can get stuck. And so some sisters, just like brothers, we are mentally stuck in our teenage years, mentally stuck in our young child years. It's true. It is absolutely true that your physical age and your mental age are not necessarily the same thing. It is absolutely a fact. So, let's move on to the next issue. We're going to deal with therapy now. And the issue here is black girls do not get the same level of psychological attention that black boys get. Black girls do not get the same level of attention and investigation into their psychological issues as black boys. Why is this, Dr. Umar Johnson? I'm going to tell you why. Because black boys, boys, tend to externalize their emotional problems. Boys externalize their emotional problems. What do I mean when I say boys externalize their emotional problems? That means they act them out. ADHD, that is an externalizing disorder. Emotional disturbance, that is normally an externalizing problem. Conduct disorder, that is an externalizing issue. Disruptive behavior, dis that is an externalizing. Oppositional defiant disorder, that is an externalizing issue. You see that? So because boys act on their environment, because boys act out their problems on the environment, they automatically get more attention, especially since they are perceived as American public enemy number one anyway. Black boys are perceived as American public enemy number one anyway. So whenever they do anything, they're going to get all the attention. And because all the attention is on controlling black boys, we don't even notice the quiet little girl in the back of the room who's contemplating suicide. We don't even notice the quiet little girl in the back of the room who's been overdosing on pills. We don't even notice the quiet little girl in the back of the room who popping pills, who digging in her arm and cutting in her arm. Girls do a lot of self-mutilation to deal with this stress. Girls more than boys will do what? Self-harm as a way to externalize their pain. A boy will do what? Just beat up another kid. A boy will go rob somebody. A boy will throw a chair, bust a bottle. Girl isn't going to do that. But the girl will take some scissors or take a pen and she will write all in her skin. That's how girls externalize. You see? But because she's not misbehaving, because the girl is not misbehaving, nobody pays any attention to it. Because the girl is not misbehaving, nobody pays any attention to the girl. Are y'all following me? And see, a well-behaved girl, if a girl is well-behaved, she can be homicidal, suicidal. She can be a psychopath. But if a girl is well-behaved, she will be overlooked. Let me tell you a little story. When I was a school psychologist intern, when I was a school psychologist intern at the school district of Philadelphia, this was back in the year 2000. I was at Wanamaker Middle School, Wanamaker Middle School at 12th and Cecil B. Moore. Temple University has since bought it and tore it down and turned it into a parking lot or some shit. White gentrification. But when I was at Wanamaker, I had to evaluate this beautiful seventh grader. 
She was model gorgeous. She came in and I look at her record and I said, princess, can I ask you a question? She said, yes. I said, your attendance is perfect. You're being evaluated for a learning disability. You're being evaluated for a learning disability. You don't have no behavior problems. You got straight A's and B's. Your attendance is perfect. I tested this young lady. Never forget it. Intelligence was off the chart. Intelligence was off the chart. But the reading scores were very low. And it didn't make any sense because she she shown no evidence. She bore no evidence of any psychological issues relating to learning. That is the acquisition and retention of new information. So I asked her. Most psychologists don't ask the children. I asked them because they normally tell you what's up. I said, can you please explain to me how you come to school every day? Intelligence off the chart and you can't read. Guess what she told me? I'll never forget it. This beautiful little seventh grade black girl told me. She said, Mr. Johnson, I wasn't doctor yet. I wasn't doctor yet. She said, Mr. Johnson, th my problem is that I've never been taught. She said, because I am pretty. She said this. She said, because I am pretty, they just pass me on. She said, I don't have to learn nothing because I am cute. I will get A's and B's and I will get pushed to the next grade. And guess what? I found out she was right and she wasn't the last one. She wasn't. The, see, the boys, they don't get pushed on. They throw them out now. They used to socially promote black boys. Now they kick them out, let them drop out, discipline school, juvenile. But the black girls, a black girl might be dumb as a doorknob. Black girl might be dumb as a doorknob, but if she is attractive and quiet, she will be socially promoted. But it will catch up with her when it's time to take the mandatory graduation exam. It will catch up with her. And that's why mothers and fathers, parents and caregivers and foster parents and adopted parents, y'all have to stay on top of your daughter's education because they will come home with A's and B's and don't know nothing. Because they cute and quiet. So the cute and quiet girl suffers just as much as the loud, misbehaving black boy, but she suffers in a different way. She suffers in a different way. Don't let them push your daughter on just because she's cute. Because you see what they're doing? They're socializing your daughter to rely on her physical beauty. So if a girl only feels good because she looks good, what happens when she don't look good no more? What happens when she's 40, 50, and 60 and the youthful beauty begins to decline? That means her self-esteem is going to drop with it? That means her self-image is going to drop with it? We can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. See, they don't put the black girls on the medicine as much. They do, but not as much. Not as much. They don't put them in the emotional support classroom as much. They do, but not as much. Not as much. See, with them, they are victims of a silent, a silent holocaust. See, the black boy holocaust is loud. It's in your face. It's police genocide. It's being kicked out of school. It's mass incarceration. It's unemployment. Black girl is different. Black girl is different. They are more subtle with her. Hers is more psychological. The black boys is more physical. Hers is more psychological. She could be hurting and nobody even knows it. See, the black boy has the externalizing disabilities, but the black girls have internal disability. Internal. What do I mean when I say internalizing disability? These are mental illnesses that you don't see. You can see ADHD. You can see conduct disorder. You can see, uh, you can't see depression. You can't see anxiety. You can't see the eating disorder. You can't see the bulimia. You don't see that. You see? So our girls are suffering from the depression. 
They suffer from the worryation. They suffer from the low self-esteem. They suffer from the eating disorder. They suffer from the sex abuse. You can't see it. And the only way you can find out is if you do what, y'all? Talk to them. You got to talk to them. All the black boys, they got one-to-one -one aids. All the black boys, they got a mobile therapist. All the black boys, they got a case manager. All the black boys, they got mental health workers. The black boys got a whole mental health team that ain't doing nothing but pimping them. They not helping them. It's all about money. It's about money. Mental health is money. The M in mental health is about money. I keep telling y'all this. So from one angle, from one angle, I'm glad the girls were being overlooked to a small extent. I want y'all to understand me. Not overlooked by the community, but I'm glad they were being overlooked by the white mental health establishment. Because since the girls are being overlooked by the white mental health establishment, that gives us time to get in and work with our girls and get them right before the white man starts looking at the girls as another mental health hustle. They have already exploited the black boys as a mental health hustle. Hustle. So now we need to get on our job so they don't exploit our girls as a mental health hustle. Are y'all following me? Give me a black fist if you following me. See, I'm glad they didn't get the girls yet. I don't want our daughters strung out on Ritalin. I don't want our daughters strung out on Adderall. I don't want our daughters strung out on Concerta. I don't want our daughters strung out on Stratera. I'm glad that they didn't start looking for the girls yet. I'm glad. They done messed the boys up. So we got a chance to get this right. Because guess what? Once they done hooked all the boys on dope, and they just about there, they going to start looking at the girls next. So the community got time to save our princesses. Who want to work with Dr. Umar Johnson to save our girls? Let's save our girls before they start coming after the girls because they're going to come. Capitalism demands a market for its product. Capitalism demands a market for its product. So they didn't already dominated the boy market. So they're about to start dominating the black girl market if we don't do something soon. I'm glad our daughters ain't on Prozac for depression. I'm glad. But the reason we can't find out that our daughters are suffering in silence. Why am I focused on black people? Because I'm black. That was the dumbest question I was ever asked. That was the dumbest question. Somebody just asked me, why am I focusing on black folks? And I bet you that was a black person who asked me that dumbass question. You see how sick we are? I ain't never see nobody ask the Jews why they focused on the Jews. I ain't never see nobody ask the Russian why they focused on the Russian. I ain't never see nobody ask the Anglo-Saxon why they focused on the British. I ain't never see nobody ask the Chinese why you focused on the Chinese. Ain't nobody ever been to Chinatown and asked a single Chinese merchant, why is your store's sign written in Chinese? Do you know most people in this city cannot speak Chinese? Did y'all ever ask them that? Hell no. Because he don't give a damn. He is Chinese. That's what God made him. That's where he going to be. And he ain't trying to be somebody else. That's y'all damn problem. Y'all so in love with trying not to be you. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There is no black privilege in America. There's a black gay male privilege. Now, if you're a black gay male, then there's a certain privilege because the white man doesn't feel threatened by gay black men. So if you're a gay black male, you have a gay black male privilege. Just like if you're a lesbian female, you can have a black lesbian privilege, but it's not a racial privilege. Okay? It's a sexual identity privilege. See, white supremacy has manipulated black America so much now. And it's our fault because of our self-hate. We don't want to be black. Most of us don't want to be black. Let's just be honest. We don't. We do not want to be. We hate ourselves. We hate ourselves. Okay? But they manipulated us 
so much, you see, that we don't want to fight to resurrect blackness. We just want to fight to be accepted by white folks. And I got some bad news for y'all Negroes. I got some bad news and I shouldn't have to tell you this because we've been here 400 years. As oppressed people, we were here longer than that. As free people, but as oppressed people for centuries. And y'all don't want to hear this, but the truth of the matter is integration will never happen. I know you don't want, I know you don't want to hear that because you love white folks. I know you don't want me to hear that. I know you don't want to hear it. It's not going to happen. Integration ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. It would be racial suicide for them. They cannot do that. Are you crazy? You cannot yet let genetically dominant people, that's Africans. We are the genetically dominant species. You cannot let a genetically dominant species run wild against a genetically inferior species. You can't do that unless you want to wipe out the genetically recessive gene. So they can't integrate with you. It doesn't make sense for them. So it's not going to happen. And see, you're the only people who want to be integrated. Nobody trying to integrate, but you. Name me a people in America. Name me a culture that's trying to integrate with white folks. Name me one. Chinese that got the, Koreans got their own thing. Arabs got their own thing. East Indians got their own thing. Japanese got their own thing. Native Americans on the reservation. They got you the only people in the country trying to integrate with white folks. It's not going to happen. You've been doing it for 400 years. It ain't going to work. And you know what's so sad? The only reason why you want integration, the only reason why you want integration is because you don't want to look at other black folks. You're trying to disappear. You want to disappear amongst whiteness. You want to disappear amongst whiteness. See, when a black person says, when a black person says, I don't see color, do you know what you're really saying? What you're really saying is I don't want nobody to see me. See, when you say you love all people, see, that's coded language. We speak in codes, too. When you say I love everybody, not just black folks, what you're really saying is I love anybody except black folks. That's what you really say. I love anybody except black folks. Yes. Yes. If a war began today between revolutionary inspired blacks and white folks hypothetically right because we can't win a war not in this condition i'm willing to bet you 75 percent of black america would fight with the oppressor who wants to bet me i said if a war if a race war broke out in america today if a race war broke out in america today and the white man said which of you black people want to come and fight with us against your own people? How much you want to bet 75% of you Negroes would fight with the whites? How much you want to bet? I didn't study you Negroes. I know you. The whole Teppers too. They be fighting too with their onks on their neck. Fighting with the white man with an onk on their neck. Mm-hmm. It'd be Moors over there. Some Moors would be fighting with them. Some Hebrews would be fighting with them. Some so-called Pan-Africanists would be fighting. Oh, yeah. He knows you. You can't fool the white man. He knows all you want is to be accepted. That's it. You ain't got no goals for your community. You just want to be accepted by your oppressor. You are sick. <laughs> Let's get back to the black girls. So we got to get our black girls help. Mental health from black folks with no drugs. With no drugs.
The other thing that we have to deal with as it relates to black girls, we have to stop socializing our daughters to be baby mamas instead of wives. We have to stop socializing our daughters to be baby moms instead of wives. Very few black girls are nurtured by the community. Mother, father, church, mosque, community. Very few black girls are nurtured by the family to look at themselves as a wife. Very few. See, if you don't have no expectations for yourself, if you don't have no standards for yourself, it is very easy to get trapped into being a teenage mother. And most teenage mothers live in poverty. And if a black girl has a baby before she graduates high school, there's a 75% chance she will not finish. Teenage pregnancy is a poverty trap. Teenage pregnancy for a black girl is a poverty trap. Teenage pregnancy for a black girl is a damn poverty trap. And the other thing that we have to do for our babies, our beautiful black queens, is we got to make sure that their free time ain't free. Does anybody know when most girls get pregnant? Teenagers. Guess when they get pregnant? They're not getting pregnant overnight because they sleep in your house. Guess when they get pregnant? Between after school and when mommy and daddy get home. Between after school and when mommy and daddy get home. So that's three to seven. Sun is still up. Your daughter gets pregnant not under the moonlight, but under the sunlight. Four, three to seven. So from three to seven, we in the summertime coming up. This is the perfect time for you to embrace this reality because in a couple weeks, most of our daughters going to be free for the summer. It's hot outside. Their hormones going to be popping. So let me ask you parents, and I'm not going to put it all on the mothers because it shouldn't all be on the mothers. Black mothers are overworked as it is. Black mothers are overworked as it is. Two and three jobs, full-time mom, full-time wife. The community needs to make sure that we have positive, effective, organized, programmed activities for our daughters between three and seven during the school year and all day during the summertime. All day during the summertime. Most girls get pregnant between three and seven. Make sure your daughter is involved in an activity and stop leaving it up to her whether she wants to do it or not. I'm getting tired of hearing mothers tell me she don't want to be in no activity. She just want to relax this summer. Are you out of your damn mind? What do you mean your daughter just want to relax? She will be relaxing on her back. She is a queen in becoming. She likes boys. Boys like her. Her hormones is popping. She will not just be relaxing. You are a fool if you think your 15, 16 year old daughter ain't think about boys and ain't think about sex. Because in case you don't know, in case you don't know, the average age at which a child loses their virginity in America is between 11 and 13. Did y'all hear that? Our children are losing their virginity between 11 and 13. That's 5th and 7th grade. They having sex. And every other parent, my daughter ain't having sex. Everybody's in denial. My daughter ain't having sex. My daughter ain't having. Everybody don't think they daughter having no damn sex. Well, if she ain't having no sex, why the hell we got this gonorrhea rape running around? If she ain't having no sex, why we got this chlamydia popping off? If she ain't having no sex, why we got a herpes epidemic? If she ain't having no sex, where all these crabs and scabies and genital warts is coming from? Stop being in denial. Talk to your daughters about sex. That's half the problem. We don't communicate with our children about sex. Some of us are still trapped in a dreamland where we think they don't start turning on sexual attraction until they're 21 years old. 
You crazy. You live in the United States of America, which is a dysfunctional society where everything is sold, marketed, advertised, and promoted through the use of sex. Everything in America is pushed through sex. Everything. Everything is sex. Everything is sex. So how your daughter going to live in this reality? And not only do you got heterosex, you got this. You got this. So you can't just even worry about the boys no more. You got to worry about the girls too. You got to interview your daughter's girlfriends because they might be a he, she, she, he, this shit. You got this shit too. So you got to get on your game. It's not a game out here. Another problem for our daughters. Black girls suffer more than black boys from a lack of effective role modeling and mentorship. And we don't like to use the word mentor. Okay. It's, it's a lot easier to get men to spend time with boys than it is to get women to spend time with girls. It's a lot easier to get men to spend time with boys than it is to get women to spend time with girls because women have an adversarial relationship with girls. And I know what it comes from. You know where it, st it stems from the shortage of black men. It stems from the shortage of black men. See, I'm 40 years old. If there's a handsome 21-year-old brother, you understand? He's not a threat to me because there's so many women in my own age group that he, I don't have to compete with him. And there's so many women in his age group, he don't have to compete with me. So brothers in their 40s generally, unless you got an insecurity, inferiority issue, we ain't got issues with the next generation of brothers. You feel me? You feel me? Don't hate the player, hate the game, right? He, he doing his thing. I'm cool. I'm in my 40s. I love sisters in their late 30s and 40s. You understand me? He's in his 20s. He's doing his thing. But when you deal with women, when you deal with women, there ain't enough men to go around. So when a 40-year-old woman look at a 25-year-old woman, she see competition. When a black man at 40 look at a 25-year-old man, we don't see competition. We see a young brother. But when a 40-year-old woman see a 25-year-old woman, she sees competition because it ain't enough men to go around. So women got this issue where they don't really want to engage and embrace black girls because they see them as a threat as a possible barrier to them finding a man. It's facts. It's facts. You ask the brothers to spend time with the boys, the brothers spend time with the boys. You ask the women to spend time with the girls, oh, she thinks she grown. She's smelling herself. Her breast's bigger than mine. I can't tell her nothing. She too grown. You ain't even met her yet. You ain't even talked to her yet, and you done already made an, a, a, a prejudice assumption about your daughter because they belong to us so i'm saying your daughter you ain't even met her yet and you didn't already made a prejudiced assumption about that princess because you feel threatened you feel threatened by her beauty that's a damn shame that's a damn shame and then we got to talk about black girls and suicide we got to talk about black girls and suicide. What do we know about suicide? Boys complete suicide more than girls. But girls attempt suicide more than boys. Did y'all hear me? Boys complete suicide more than girls. But girls attempt suicide more than boys. Suicide is a bigger issue for girls than it is for boys. Yes, yes. It, suicide looks like it's a bigger issue for boys. Why? Because boys tend to complete more often. And I'm going to tell you why. When girls 
start trying to harm themselves. When girls start trying to harm themselves, what do they do? They overdose and they cut. Girls tend to overdose and they cut. They overdose and they cut. Boys will shoot and hang themselves. Boys don't attempt as much as girls. Girls attempt suicide far more often than boys do. Far more often than boys do. But boys will complete because the manner at which a boy attempts suicide through hanging and shooting, you're more likely to die as opposed to cutting and overdosing. Somebody may find you. Somebody may find you in time and be able to bring you back to consciousness, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay? As we start to roll this down, another issue with teenage girls, they're being forced by school, public, government, and their parents to use very dangerous methods of contraception. Black girls are more likely than the women of any other race to be forced to use dangerous contraception early in life. They got black girls with the Depro Provera, black girls with the, uh, the shot so they don't get pregnant, black girls with the birth control, black girls with the morning after pill, a black girl's body. A black girl's body has been through more than a white woman in 50. A black girl's body has been through more abortions, more STDs, more forced early term abortions than a white female, middle class white female at 50 years old. Teach your daughters condoms. Use condoms. If she's allergic to latex, then get lamb skin. But we cannot afford for our daughters to be taking these drugs so early in life and then it lead to fibroid cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer. It's not healthy for them to be doing that. If they sexually active, teach them to use condoms, build up their discipline and self-control. If you don't want to put a condom on his little dirty ass wee wee, then walk out the house. It's that simple. You don't get none. At least you live to see another day. And also, because we got this shit going on, black teenage girls have to deal with brothers on the down low passing off that HIV. That's another big problem with the teenage dating. That's another big problem with the teenage. The girls ain't just got to worry about rape and molestation. Now they got to worry about he, she's, and download teenage boys. We got to do something about that. More abortions. Black teenage girls are more likely to abort than anybody else. And a black girl is more likely to suffer long-term effects as a result of that abortion. Now, you know, back in the days, in the 50s and the 60s, they had the back alley abortions. Remember that? They'd take a, take a girl and somebody put a hanger inside that baby. Oh, my God. That make my stomach hurt to even hear that. But this is what good Christians used to do back in the 40s and 50s. Good Christians would take their daughters and send them to somebody and they would get a backyard, backdoor, alleyway abortion. I heard they still giving them out. I heard they still giving them out. Absolutely unacceptable. And then we got to talk about what? Domestic abuse. Teenage black girls are being beat on by their boyfriends. Teenage black girls are being beat on by their boyfriends. And they think it's cute. Some of them think it's cute. I see it in the high school. They think if the boy hit them and be jealous and possessive, it's a form of love. 
He got to beat me to show me that he loves me. He got to hurt me to show me that he loves me. I see it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And most of the time, she was in a house where she saw the mother get beat. And since the mother got beat and stayed, she feels that she needs to be whipped or cursed out or get her hair pulled by a boy to feel like he care about me. So now, pain is the new love. Pain is the new love. If he don't cause me no pain, he don't love me. If he don't show me no jealousy, he don't love me. Some of you brothers might can identify with this. How many of you brothers watching this broadcast have dealt with women who didn't feel like you liked them or care because you would not put your hands on them? How many of you black men have dealt with women? Who tried to get you to hit them so they could feel secure in the relationship. I know it's sick. It's very sick, but it's very true. It is very sick, but it is very true. Some women need to be abused in order to feel desired. Some women got to be abused in order to feel loved. Some women need to be beat. So that they know that they are wanted. That is insane. That is insane. And then these girls are getting their eyes blacked. They're being punched, beat on. And then they go home to their mom. They go home to their mom. And the mother doesn't even do anything about it. Yes. Domestic abuse early in life. And because the girl didn't have her daddy, her self-esteem is through the floor so low. She feel like she got to stay and put up with the abuse because she'd rather be beat by him than be alone by herself. She'd rather be beat by him than be alone by herself. Y'all know that this is true. Y'all know that this is true. And then another problem we got. Incarceration of teenage mothers. First of all, incarceration of black teenage girls. You know, black women got the fastest incarceration rate. Black male incarceration is already high. After the black males, black women have the fastest growing incarceration rate in the United States of America. Black women have the fastest growing incarceration rate in the United States of America. And when they get to jail, they're more likely to be abused in jail. By male guards and lesbian female inmates. By male guards and lesbian female inmates. I've been told stories by black girls who've been locked up. How they had to fight back against the lesbians. How they had to fight back against the male guards. How they'd be sexually taken advantage of by the men who work for the prison and nothing is ever done about it. I've heard about this. And then when you lock that teenage mother up, you separate her from her child. She ends up in a foster care system. And now the daughter is being raped and abused and exploited just like the mother was. And I'm going to tell you something. Going back to the missing girls in D.C., going back to the missing girls in D.C., I don't think they've been sold to no international sex ring. No, no, no. They've been sold to a domestic sex ring and many times by black men. Many times by black men. We got some brothers out here who have zero respect for black women. These older men. It goes right back to letting young girls date these older young men. And these men turn them out sexually and emotionally. And she's so thirsty. That he can manipulate that girl into having sex with his friends. He can manipulate that girl into doing anything, especially if she's homeless, especially if she's a teenage mom, especially if she's pregnant, especially she ain't got no dad, especially she ain't got no mother who cares about her. That boy will have your daughter turn in every trick in the neighborhood. 
And our daughters don't even realize that what it is, it's, it's, it's unpaid prostitution. It's unpaid prostitution. See, if, if a man tells a young girl, I'll pay you for sex, she knows it's prostitution. If a man tells a young girl, I'll pay you for sex, she knows it's prostitution. She knows it. But if he just endears himself to her, sexually exploits her, and then passes her around, she don't look at it as prostitution. She just look at it as some failed dating experiences, some failed relationship hookups. And then he puts something in her drink, and the next day, you know, she waking up, and she been gang raped by 6, 12, 20 men. They pulling trains on our daughters because we letting them date these older men. You don't let your daughter date no grown-ass man. I don't care how mature she thinks she is. But I've seen mothers and fathers, I've seen this. Let their daughter date the drug dealers in the neighborhood who's older. Because the drug dealer will take care of the parents financially. Y'all know this is true. Y'all know this is true. Y'all know this is true. The parents will let the daughter date the drug dealer because the drug dealer will give them money for letting him date the daughter. In other words, he's paying the parents to prostitute their child. He is paying the parents to prostitute their child. How many of y'all seen this in the hood? This goes on in all the hoods across America. When you got some 28-year-old dating some 17-year-old and mommy and daddy looked the other way because he putting a couple thousand dollars in their hand, giving them some free weed or some free crack or some free heroin, we have lost our damn mind. We have lost our damn mind. 60% of black teenage girls have been sexually abused. 60% of black teenage girls have been sexually abused and most of them will be raped again when they become adults. I don't even like saying that. This is coming straight from the statistics. 60% of all teenage girls have been molested and most of them will be raped again when they become an adult. And this is why I tell you, sisters. This is why I tell you, sisters. You cannot be going into a man's house if you don't know him like that. You cannot be going into a man's house if you don't know him like that. Some men believe they got a right to take sex from you if they paid money for you. Some men believe that. They will rape you and keep it moving. And sexual predators come in all ages in income brackets and professions and political ideologies. Sexual predators, rapists, come in all ages, all incomes, all professions, all races, all political ideologies. What y'all doing? Once a woman get her innocence taken like that, that sets her up for post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress, that's a hell of a mental illness. And a lot of women suffer from post-traumatic stress because they've been abused. Some women can't even enjoy sex no more. Some women can't even enjoy intimacy no more. They can't even get moist when they get aroused because subconsciously the mind has been conditioned through trauma to view every man as a potential perpetrator of sexual violence. This is what's happening in our neighborhood. Where the black church at? Where the black masjid at? I don't want no religion. I want solutions. I don't want no more religion. I want solutions. Keep your religion to yourself and give me solutions. We want solutions. We don't want no more beliefs. Every time black America has a problem, somebody want to come and give us a whole bunch of beliefs. We don't need no damn beliefs. We need solutions. So I'm going to prepare to wrap this up. Get me some sleep. Got a couple radio interviews tomorrow here in St. Louis. If you're in St. Louis, I need to know where I can go and get some good black food, some soul food. 
when if y'all got a black veggie spot, I'll eat the black veggie spot. It's all about health. Soul food or veggie. I need a black owned restaurant in St. Louis. Hit Dr. Umar up. Text me some info for the black owned restaurant. I need that. Okay. So Friday night, St. Louis. Sunday afternoon, Kansas City. Then I will be in Hong Kong, Japan. I think that's the 20th. Nagoya, Japan, the 21st. Shanghai, China, the 25th, I think. Beijing, China, the 26th. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York City. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be in Brooklyn on Friday, June 2nd. Get your tickets. You can get your tickets three ways. You can go to the website, drumarjohnson.com, and click on the Eventbrite link. But you have to use your computer. If you use the cell phone site, you cannot purchase tickets from my website on the cell phone site. It's under construction. You can only purchase tickets off of the computer website. Okay? So you can, if you're on your computer, drumarjohnson.com, click on the Eventbrite link. It's right there on the homepage. If you're on your cell phone, then you have to go straight to Eventbrite. Type in Prince of Pan-Africanism. And we spell Africa with a K. Type in Prince of Pan-Africanism. Dot Eventbrite.com. Prince of Pan-Africanism. Dot Eventbrite.com. And if you're still having trouble by going to my website, or going directly to the link, because some of y'all still be having trouble because of the phones, then text me and I will text you the ticket purchase link. Text me and I will text you the ticket purchase link. 215 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. And I will text you the link. Tickets are going fast. Don't wait to the last minute, St. Louis. Get your tickets. Y'all love to wait to the last minute. Kansas City, don't wait to the last minute. Brooklyn, New York City, don't wait to the last minute. Get your tickets now. 12 and under are always free. 65 and older are always free. 12 and under, no tickets needed. 65 and older, no tickets needed. Okay, Minneapolis, Minnesota, where my Minneapolis people at? Where my Minneapolis people at? Okay, I heard y'all losing Adrian Peterson. Adrian Peterson is on his way to the Saints. He's leaving Minnesota. Dr. Umar will be speaking in Minneapolis, Minnesota on Wednesday, June 14th. Minneapolis, Minnesota Wednesday, June 14th, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Wednesday, June 14th. Y'all know we have a very important organization that I'm very serious about, the National Independent Black Parent Association, the National Independent Black Parent Association. Please come to Detroit, June 9th and 10th, Detroit, Michigan, June 9th and 10th. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be in Detroit, Michigan, June 9th and 10th for the 4th Regional Midwest Training. If you want to start a chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association, if you want to start a chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association, join us in Detroit from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. June 9th and 10th, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., June 9th and 10th in Detroit. If y'all care about our kids, help us fight for them. If y'all care about our children, help us organize their parents. Don't be an armchair revolutionary. Stop being a Facebook activist. Stop being an Instagram agitator. You got to do the work. The problem with the black consciousness community, nobody's doing any work. Everybody wants to be a teacher, a professor, a scholar, and a philosopher. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be a teacher, a professor, a scholar, and a philosopher, but you still have to be a worker, a builder, an organizer, and an activist. 
Seattle, Washington, Seattle, Washington, Seattle, Washington. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be delivering a very important Juneteenth message to black Seattle, black Tacoma, Saturday, June 17th. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be back in Seattle for the first time in four years. Black College and Consciousness Tour, June 28th to July 12th. Black College and Consciousness Tour, June 28th to July the 12th. If you got sons or daughters, we're going to do the same tour we did last year. New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. The Harriet Tubman Home, the Frederick Douglass Grave, the Nat Turner Trail, Benjamin Banneker Home, Black African Holocaust Museum, Harriet Tubman Hometown, the Underground Railroad, the Great Blacks and Wax Museum, Cheney University, Lincoln University, Howard University, Hampton University, Virginia State, uh... A Miss Coppin, Morgan, Bowie, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. 14 days, 14 nights. Registration coming next week. If you want to go to Africa with Dr. Umar Johnson, we're going to Africa again. Ghana, Togo, Benin. Ghana, Togo, Benin. July 27th to August the 10th. 14 days and 14 nights. We're going to the Cape Coast Slave Dungeon. El Mina Slave Dungeon. Asin Mansour. Panathes, African Naming Ceremony, Temple of Pythons. You will go to the hometown of Toussaint La Overture, leader of the Haitian Revolution. Come with us to Africa. If you need the registration for Africa, you can email me or text me. Deposits are due by May 12th. Deposits are due by May 12th if you're going to Africa. Deposits are due by May 12th if you're going with us to Africa. You can email me for it, drumarjohnson.com, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com, or you can text my cell, 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. So I'm about to sign out, Black Family. I want to thank all of you for joining in. St. Louis, can't wait to see you Friday. Get them tickets. Kansas City, can't wait to see you Sunday. Japan, can't wait to see you. I skipped the country. God forgive me. God forgive me. I went from Kansas City straight to Japan and straight to China. May the ancestors forgive me for leaving out the motherland. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be in Africa. From May the 2nd to May the 10th, I will be in the Kingdom of Lesotho. From May the 2nd to May the 10th, the capital city of Maseru, Lesotho is a small, powerful country in the middle of South Africa. It is a small, powerful country in the middle of South Africa. The Kingdom of Lesotho, which is an independent nation, formed from multiple tribes who came together to make a single people during the days of the reign of the great Shaka, Kasensa Kagona Zulu. During the days of Shaka, many of the tribes ran and they formed their own tribe from the remnants of so many others. And that became the kingdom of Lesotho. Shout out to my Lesotho people. I will see all of you next week. Less than a week, I will be in South Africa under the sun of South Africa. We will be looking at school locations. Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy might be in Africa, might be in Detroit, might be in Chicago. We still looking. We had a good place in Queens, New York. I thought I had a school in Queens, excuse me, not Queens, Mount Vernon. Money earning Mount Vernon. I found the perfect Cap Vernon only to find out that they don't want to lease the school to the Prince of Pan-Africanism. The Roman Catholics don't want to rent the school to the Prince of Pan-Africanism. I was going to shock y'all. I was going to shock everybody. We had. I, I was going to put the down payment. It was the perfect location. And then the Roman Catholic Church hated on me. But we're not going to stop, brothers and sisters. We're going to keep on going. We're going to keep on pushing. I want to thank all my supporters for standing behind me. Okay, I want to thank all y'all who speak up for me and take up for me. I really do appreciate it because a lot of people who claim to be my supporters, they will stand by, let people hate and don't say shit. Some of them are even friends with haters and claim to be a supporter of mine. How are you going to be friends with haters? 
I can see being friends with people who don't support me. But how are you going to be friends with someone who's actively trying to destroy probably the most significant young black leader and organizer in this country? Not conscious, period. How many children have I saved with the grace of God? How many parents have I helped with the grace of God? How many people have I educated? How many lives have I saved with the grace of God? So how are you going to sit there and let people hate and you don't look out for me and I'm fighting the way that I'm fighting? Not just teaching, but fighting. So on that note, brothers and sisters, don't worry. I'm going to go back through my feed and I'm going to block all the haters. Don't worry about that. They won't be posting ever again. So no need to worry about that. Ohio, I'm looking for a venue in Columbus. I can't find a venue in Columbus. Cincinnati, I'm trying to get the same church. Cleveland. Cleveland, you will see me too. No date yet. San Antonio, Dallas. We work Austin, Texas. Still trying to lock down a venue. Black Parent Teleconference every Tuesday morning. Don't forget. If you need a private consultation, that's $50. I could text you the link. If you need to purchase my book, if you need to purchase my book, if you need to purchase my book, email or text me and I will send you the link to purchase my book. Do not purchase it on Amazon. Those are bootlegs. Purchase the book from me. I will ship it to you. Do not purchase it on Amazon. Those are bootlegs. They are of worse quality. It's not a good book. It's a knockoff. And we got an investigation right now. We're trying to find the bootlegger. And I suspect that the bootlegger is a whole tepper. Rumor has it that the bootlegger is a whole tepper. I'll be damned. So on that tip, black family, everybody be blessed. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>